Okay, hello everyone. Uh, this is British in American culture. Uh, the 14th century. <clears throat> I believe we're on week four. And uh, we've already talked about the major events uh, from the century. I just want to um, add a few things that I couldn't get to. <clears throat> we sort of talked about what the problems were that resulted from the two disasters, right? Uh, the Great Famine by itself would have been a disaster because there was an overpopulation problem. Uh, they didn't have enough jobs, really. <clears throat> um, there was so many people that uh, labor costs were really low. And uh, when the famine came along and uh, crops were bad for about seven years in a row, um, there was a population crash. Uh, many people starved and many people were undernourished and got sick. That generation grew up. Um, some of them died, some of them were sick, but survived. And then the Black Death arrived from Europe, uh, came across Asia, through the Black Sea, uh, by the Middle East, through Turkey, um, into the Italian peninsula and from there across Europe. So the 1340s, uh, that generation was even particularly vulnerable, uh, not because of immunity to the disease, but just the fact that their constitutions were weak anyway. Uh, so they went through that, which uh, cut out maybe by the end of the century, we're talking about half a population of decline in total of half the population of England. So about 5 million people in England going into the 14th century and less than 3 million uh, at the end. So a lot of areas of England, as I said, <clears throat> they started to uh, abandon some places and um, the, the area that was under farming and being used um, declined and would not really recover until the 18th century. So it takes hundreds of years for them to, for the population to rebound and for the, the land to start be, being under cultivation again. As a result of th those disasters, there's a lot less people. And when you have a lot less people, suddenly this has a, an economic effect. Obviously, um, having less people around means that the economic output is lower, but it means each individual uh, has, is more valuable and can, is um, likely to receive higher pay. So wages jumped and uh, the, the survivors actually were in a better position individually uh, because the the, the wealthy people, the merchants and the landowners in particular, who, who had laborers working on their lands and producing their goods, um, they had to pay more uh, because there just wasn't enough, there wasn't enough labor available. So they, they needed people to work harder for one thing, but they just um, couldn't demand, they couldn't, uh, the, the laborers could demand more um, from their employers, uh, which the, the, when the economy is, uh, is, is, uh, damage and a severe depression. It's pretty hard for business owners to pay more. It's sort of similar to the situation we're in now, where inflation is going up and people need more money and co things cost more, but the companies are making less money, so they're less willing to pay. Uh, they didn't have a modern economic system, so it was simply a, a matter of uh, the barons and the landowners, the wealthy upper class people, going to the king and saying, we need to make some laws. Uh, to make people work the way they did before um, because we can't afford to pay this much money and um, we need to make sure that these uh, these peasants and these serfs stay when we pay them and we get them to do work they stay there and they do their their work for their entire life for the entire contract uh, just like we did before so they made some laws very unpopular laws that basically try to roll things back. This is often what conservative governments do, is try to change the laws back or, or go back to what it was like before. Consi they consider it some sort of golden age, right? So um, the same, we'll talk about this in America, you know, progressive politics is changing the laws and trying to, to um, adapt to what, what the future is and what the current situation is. And con conservative politics essentially are trying to keep things the same or in some cases, rolling things back to the way they were before. This happens all the time. So this is an attempt to do that, to make things like they were before the Black Death. But as we all know, it, that's not possible. You can't turn back the clock. People are different. 
the country is different, there's less people, the different types of people. Um, so they, when they try to do that, uh, a revolt breaks out. It's called the Peasants Revolt, but that's kind of not correct. It's not just peasants. There, a lot of these people who are leading this, um, they are tradesmen, you know. They, they are, they're skilled laborers. The, the leader of this, this um, ragtag, like, I mean, not ragtag, it's a massive group of peasants, you know, thousands of peasants, maybe tens of thousands of peasants in Eastern England. They start in Kent, they start gathering in big groups and they start to get organized under a person named Watt Tyler. And we don't know very much about this guy, except that he probably was a soldier who actually fought uh, in the army uh, it, with the English on the English side. So he had some military experience. Uh, his name is Tyler, so he was probably a tiler. He probably put tiles on roofs. So that was his, his uh, trade. Um, and Watt, Watt is a short form of Walter. So he's, he's Walter the roof tiler. And um, he had good leadership skills and everybody looked to him to lead them. So uh, gradually they coalesced into this huge group of people with, you know, not, not armor and they don't have the same kind of weapons as a professional army, but they all have pitchforks and knives and axes and maybe some of them have swords too. Uh, they go around <clears throat> burning the, the records of taxes and of, of uh, you, know, you know, tenants, um, rent pays and stuff, things that, that um, keep track of debt and things like that because they're really angry. One, about uh, the, this new poll tax that uh, the king has imposed on them, um, which means everybody has to pay a certain amount of money, which is to poor people that's unfair that they have to pay to support a war, uh, which the war is not going well, uh, partly because Richard II is 12 years old. So he's not the one leading the war, it's his uncles, in particular, a man named John of Gaunt, but uh, his father is dead because Richard the, Richard II's father was the Black Prince. His father was gonna be Edward IV, but he died. So when his grandfather died, uh, they decided to skip, to keep it in the, the first son's line. So they could have gone to the, one of the brothers, but because the family got along and the uncles were really in control, especially John of Gaunt, uh, Edward, <clears throat> Edward III, when he dies, he wants he, the black prince, he wants him, his son to succeed him. So he does, but he's still a kid. So basically, the uncles are in control. And that actually, as I said, all these people who are angry, they blame the uncles more than they blame Richard. Although they don't realize that Richard's going to grow up to be the same as his uncles. But right now, they think the king is just kind of a, a victim. Um, he's a captive and he doesn't want to do this. Um, he's, being, he's being controlled. So... They're fighting a war, they're taxing too much, and they're putting a cap on wages. So you can't make any more money, right? This is, it's the, like I said, it's the opposite of minimum wage. This would make anybody pretty angry, is that I can't make any more money because there's a rule that my boss can't pay me. But it's the bosses that make it. It's kind of like, if you want to use an analogy, it's kind of like these days, um, professional sports. I know some of you um, watch some sports, Major League Baseball or hockey or basketball or football, all of those super rich guys or soccer. Let's take soccer because Koreans love EPL. Son Hung Min plays for Tottenham Hotspurs, right? In the EPL, they pretty much let uh, the owners pay as much as they want. So the super rich teams have the best players. Like Manchester City has better players because they have unlimited money coming from the ads he had, right? Um, from, from their owners in the Middle East. Now, uh, in most leagues, though, the owners get together and they, they make a cap on how much the players can make. There's a limit. In the EPL, they don't do that, basically. But in, in the other professional sports in America, they do that. And that, that allows each owner to make more money. It's kind of a collaboration. So that's what ha what's happening here, is that all of, all of the rich people agree that they're not gonna pay any more than this amount. This makes the people who are trying to make more money very angry. <clears throat> so it goes from, from anger to protesting to gathering together and damaging things to burning things to killing people. And they head, they head towards London in this big, huge 
host. Yeah, you can't re really call it a mob. It's more like a host, which would be 20,000 people maybe. So they go across the countryside, destroying everything that they don't like, particularly things that are in the church, not because they're not religious, but because the church has a lot of these like records of how much money people owe and who, who has the property of something. So they go after church officials and royal officials. Um, when they get to London, they go, they want particular people. Um, <clears throat> they want the, the head of the, they want the, the church representative um, who handles the, the business for the church and they kill him. They, they get him and they kill him. And the chancellor, the Lord Chancellor, um, sorry, the Lord Chancellor is a church guy. Uh, they kill him. So he's basically the king's man who organizes uh, the, the, the finances of the kingdom. And he's also a church guy, but that doesn't matter. Um, that, that's, they're not concerned about whether somebody's a member of the church or not at this point. Uh, and the other guy is the, the counselor, is, he's the exchequer, who, who's the, basically the finance minister. So they kill the guy who organizes the government, and they kill the, um, <clears throat> the finance minister. And they want to kill John of Gaunt, the uncle that they think is in charge of all of this war and taxes too. He's away, lucky for him. Uh, they go to his palace, and it's called the Palace of Savoy, which is probably made from... I don't know, uh, from the taxes or from money he's gotten from war, from fighting in France, and uh, they burn that down. So they don't get John of Gaunt, um, but they're demanding basically no cap on wages. Um, you're allowed to move, so you know, um, free mobility to look for work, no, no bound to the land serfdom or anything like that. Um, they want, they want those three people. They want John of Gaunt, the, cha the Lord Chancellor, and the Exchequer. They got two of them, uh, but they want John of Gaunt too. Um, not likely that the king's going to give up his uncle, but that's what they want. Um, and they have this communist idea too, that uh, property, um, pro property would also... Well, it's not communist, I shouldn't say. Um, John Wycliffe, I'm going to talk about him. He's more of a communist. Um, they, they want, the instead of having wage caps, they want rent cap. So there's no limit to how much a landlord can, can rent his land. He, there's a limit to how much he can pay his, his uh, employees, the people working on the land. They have a limit to how much they can make, but there's no limit to how much rent they have to pay. This is ridiculous. Even in modern society, like... We sometimes do rent caps, right? You can't increase the rent. In Korea, there's a new um, a law where you can't increase the rent too much because then people can't live. It's impossible. If you have a wage cap and no rent cap, you can see how the owner could just do whatever they want. So I understand. I, I'm totally on the peasant side on most of these issues. But this is, this is a long time ago. This is 1381. The king uh, doesn't have a police force. He just has his like royal guard. His army's in France and in other places. He doesn't have very many soldiers available. So Watt Tyler says, I need to talk to you in person because I want to make these demands. So they do agree to meet. And this is a pretty brave thing to do because the, the king is a 12 year old boy. He's not a warrior or anything. He agrees to meet Watt Tyler and they have a meeting sort of in front, he, Watt Tyler, rides out in front of this huge army of peasants and tradesmen. And when they meet, they you know, start discussing things and something happens where Watt Tyler insults the king or something like that. Actually, at first, they, they present the demands and everything and Richard says, okay, I'll think about it. Uh, and they have a couple meetings. And during the meetings, uh, he does something. Uh, maybe the Lord Mayor of London jumped him. I'm, I'm always suspicious that that's what just happened. He just, the Lord Mayor of, of London just decided to kill him. But supposedly, Watt Tyler either insulted or did move something or went to draw his sword or something because he was angry, something like that in front of the king. And the Lord Mayor of London, uh, who is, he's a noble himself, pulls out a dagger and stabs him and kills him. And so Watt Tyler dies like right there and he's the leader of the entire mob. And basically King Richard says, go home now, disperse and go home and nothing will happen to you. 
And uh, in their confusion and lack of leadership, they just kind of melt away and they start to scatter. And once they start to scatter, then the king has a bunch of horses and, and some soldiers and then they start um, chasing them down. And um, actually he, he uh, lied the whole time. He had no intention of giving them what they wanted. So he, um, <clears throat> they went around afterwards, his man at arms and his knights went and uh, his, his sheriffs went and arrested all the ringleaders and killed all the leaders and um, reimposed all the rules that were before. However, uh, this is a kind of, it's not a full-blown revolution. It's an attempt at revolution, but the thing that sort of prevents um, completely chaotic revolutions in England throughout its history is that you can see the peasants themselves. They're not real revolutionaries. If they were, they would have run up there and killed King Richard and made Watt Tyler king or something like that, right? Or set up a different kind of government. They would have set up a parliament or they, they would have carried it further. That what they, they actually wanted to save the king, which is basically they, they still believe in their government system and they want to, to um, change the rules, but they don't want to change the system, you know? So it's not really a real revolution in that sense. And in the other sense is that after these rebels get dispersed and the king wins his, his uh, confrontation with them, he threatens that he's going to make their lives worse, um, even lower than before. And I'll, and I'll break your backs and stuff, but that's not what happens. In the next 10 years, all the things that they really wanted, uh, they start to to um, adjust to them. So you're not you're not bound to the land anymore. It's just not going to work the way it did before. They realize this and they realize that there, there's just going to be another sort of episode of the same thing. So the rational thing to do really is to just, um, you know, they didn't get their rent caps or anything, but the wage cap came up and uh, they were allowed, the serfdom was essentially gone. Um, nobody was required to be bound to their land anymore like a slave to their property and work on one piece of land um, for the rest of their life or for a given contract. You can still contract labor, but you're not uh, stuck on a piece of land. You're not obligated to work a piece of land. You can still contract your labor, of course, um, and you still have to work a certain place if that's where the landlord tells you to be, but you don't have an attachment to the land. That's what serfdom is. So serfdom dies. In, in England after 1381, and it takes serfdom still going uh, 500 years later in Russia. So, you know, at the turn of the 19th century, which is, yeah, this is 500 years later, um, you've got people in Russia that are, that are required to work on a, a piece of land and cannot leave. So they, they accomplished a lot, even though the, the, their uh, immediate goals failed, uh, consequently, things started to change. It's sort of like Magna Carta in that way. They forced John to sit down and sign it. He immediately says, you forced me to sign it. It doesn't mean anything. But over the next several hundred years, all the principles of Mark Magna Carta are re reinforced. Every king after John has to, in order to get the support of the barons and the people, he has to reissue Magna Carta and say, yes, I agree with this. <clears throat> so every king after John has to um, is obligated to follow the rules of Magna Carta, even though John himself di didn't really follow it um, because he was the reason that it was written in the first place. So he wasn't going to change his bad behavior. But his son and every king after that had to refer to it and had to follow what was in it. Now, <clears throat> all the things we've talked about so far... <clears throat> like the dinner and tournaments and everything, these are all sort of, they come to their peak in, in a king called King Edward III, okay? I don't want to get into him the same way I did with Henry II, but he is very important in the same way Henry is because he did so many things. Let's just focus on a few of them. He also had five sons, okay? Just like Henry. All five of them grow up to adulthood. Uh, Henry II, four of them became adults. So this is very unusual um, and it's a good thing to have lots of options for having a king. But as you saw in Henry II's case, when all the sons are fighting their father and fighting each other, this is a big problem. 
So often having too many sons is not good if they don't get along. But in the case of Edward III, his son, the Black Prince, was fighting with him, and all the brothers went along with him, and he loved his queen. Uh, there was no kind of locking in a tower or separation or divorces or separations or backstabbing like Eleanor and Henry. His wife's name was Isabella, and he's even though he had lots of mistresses, he was loved his wife dearly and treated her as a true knight, knight should, although he did have lots of mistresses, as I said. Um, so he, he was sort of, for a long time, Edward III was sometimes considered the greatest king because he was a perfect knight. He, he started a war with France. He tried to take his inheritance from, as you know, uh, there's, a, there's a claim through mother and father um, to certain lands. Normandy is, uh, comes all the way down from William the Conqueror. So he's fighting in France to retake the lands that John uh, had lost, right? Um, so he starts this war, which they don't expect it to go for 117 years, but he starts this war and he's, and he's a very capable fighter and he has some great victories uh, and he has some really, I mean, he's just like Richard, Richard the Lionheart in that sense too, just a really capable uh, leader, warrior, charismatic, loves poetry, speaks perfect French. Uh, he starts an order of the garter, which is sort of like uh, the Knights of the Round Table. He's, he's a fantastic uh, Arthurian type king. And um, he, can basically, he can basically do what he wants because the public loves him. Uh, and he wins great victories and uh, makes England proud to be a, the, a kingdom and a people. And so he was often <clears throat> considered the greatest, but I mean, his sort of his stock has gone down somewhat because as a result of his five sons, <clears throat> it won't be a problem. Uh, <clears throat> the Black Prince dies and they all say, okay, Richard II. Richard II turns into be, he turns out to be a pretty bad adult king. And when he dies, there's going to be a lot of different grandchildren who could possibly be the next king, right? So for, in the end, having these four, five sons with many, many children, and they have children, they have children, you know, by the time you get to the end of the war um, and the, the main lines die out, then who is supposed to be the next king? We have like 25 different choices. And uh, it's hard to agree. It's hard to get everybody on your side. So it's going to cause a lot of chaos. So he turned out to be a little bit too aggressive and too potent and uh, too prolific. And this is going to cause lots of problems later. Anyway, Richard II, we don't really need to talk about him other than this is his best moment. Him handling the 1381 um, revolt, uh, Peasant's Revolt, which is not really a Peasant's Revolt, as I said. That's, his, that's the peak of his career. It's all pretty much downhill from there. And this is not a course about kings. So this is going to be your sort of snapshot of the medieval period. And then after this, we're going to start, we're going to jump to the end of the medieval period. And, and we're going to go start into early modern stuff, which some of you will recognize Henry VIII and Queen Elizabeth. They're several hundred years later, but we're going to jump forward. Um, the Hundred Years War, Edward III starts this because... Uh, the king of France dies and there's no heir to the throne. And Edward III has a claim through his mother to the, the throne of France. France says, no, through your mother, doesn't matter. As you know, um, a few lectures back, uh, well, it's only one lecture back, Henry, the, Henry II, he claimed the throne through his mother, right? Henry I, Matilda, his mother, then him. So they just sort of make this excuse that in ancient France, which is Frank, uh, the Franks, Franconia, um, there's, a, there's this law called the Salic Law, which says that only male, males may claim the throne to the, through the male line. Um, this is basically an excuse because they don't really want an English king on the throne. Even one, Edward III, his first language is French, so it, it would probably be okay. Like He'd be able to manage everything. They just don't want an English king. Uh, understandably, I think. The culture is different, his, but he speaks French perfectly. He's the last English king that speaks French as a first language. Richard speaks almost perfect French, but it's not his first language. So he speaks English first, French second, but he's, his French is still 
excellent. So that wouldn't be a problem, uh, administrating or communicating or anything like that. It wouldn't be like William the Conqueror trying to talk to an English noble and be like, I don't understand you, speak French. But <clears throat> they're, bi they're fully bilingual. Um, this, this war, as you can see, 1337 starts 10 years later, boom, uh, Black Death. Where, we, where are we? So they start w fighting, winning battles and everything, and then the Black Death just shuts everything down. So th there's, it's, not, uh, it's, it's actually not 100 years, 117 years. Plus, it's not really a war. It's like a bunch of wars that are connected because they're between France and England. It's like seven different wars. They sometimes say three, and they, there's some peace treaties in between, but whatever. It's kind of off and on for so long that it's not a single war. We just call it, let, they never called it that until much later. Um, this is in the background the whole time. Eventually, the I'll explain this on Friday briefly before we go to the next chapter, but 1453 is a very significant date across Europe. That's also the date that uh, the Turkish people um, take t Constantinople. Uh, that's the day that Constantinople falls and the Byzantine Empire collapses. On the other side of the world, no, on the other side of Europe, one side of the Europe, that happens, the Turks win. Uh, on the other side, France de fully defeats the English and they, they retreat and never return um, to take back the land in France, except for they hold on to this little piece close to England, right across from Dover called Calais. They hold on to that for another hundred years, but that's really incidental. So these, the, there's these two guys that are really important. Um, Chaucer, you can read about him, but Chaucer is one of my favorite writers uh, after Shakespeare, probably my second favorite English writer, just because of, I like the way, the style. Um, he writes this, he writes this book, he writes more than one thing, but he writes this book called Canterbury Tales. Um, it was originally supposed to have like 120 stories or something, um, but it, it ends up only having 24. I think uh, he, there were supposed to be 30, pe 30 people and they were supposed to tell four stories each, but uh, he only ended up doing 24, one for each of 24 characters. The interesting thing is um, they all go to an inn and uh, the innkeeper offers them um, a, di a, a prize, you know, free food and board if uh, for the person who ch tells the best story. And there's a whole bunch of people here. What they're doing is they're going on a pilgrimage to Canterbury to see the, the shrine, remember, Becket, the shrine of St. Becket. Um, so they're on this pilgrimage and they stop at this inn and the innkeeper gives, gives them this um, sort of challenge. And one by one, they start telling stories. And you hear a, a knight tell a story and there's um, the wife of Bath, my favorite one. Uh, she's had like five husbands, five or six husbands. She just keeps getting divorced and getting a new husband. Um, there's a there's a prioress, so there's a priest, uh, there's a monk, um, there's a, there's townspeople, right? And so you get there's 24 different people of different professions and different ranks, and it's a very satirical thing sometimes. Like he's obviously criticizing certain people for their attitude and their pride. Um, he, he's um, exaggerating some things. They're kind of caricatures of real life. But you, when you read that stuff, you sort of really get a sense of what the, the culture, at least a, a sort of window into the culture and the society of the Middle Ages. We call this, they call it, in the writing he uses, it's Middle English. So we call Chaucer the father of English because he's the first one who puts together a masterpiece. Um, there are other Middle English works but Chaucer's is so dynamic and covers so many facets of the society and it, it coalesces and it's, 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 it's in poetry, um, not in rhyme, but in alliterative verse. So it's got, it's got a rhythm to it and it's, it's English. It's noticeably English. When you look at old English, you just can't understand it. It's an unfamiliar language. It looks like it could be Viking or, or old German or old Danish or something else. It doesn't seem familiar. Very few of the words match. But Middle English has got a lot of this French is sprinkled right through it because Chaucer was a lesser gentry. So he knew his French. Um, he, he makes fun. He makes fun of one of the characters for the, the way they speak French. Um, he's uh, 
he's he's a uh, had a job as a court official so he's he's seen how the government works um and he's lesser gentry uh, his ancestors were likely norman because Ch chaucer is maybe chasseur chasseur maybe he had something to do with clothing his ancestors but anyway um Geoffrey chaucer he's a very important influential writer and all of these, all the great writers of Shakespeare's day, Marlowe, Spencer, Dunn, um, Ben Jonson, uh, et cetera, Thomas More, um, there's a whole crew, there's a whole group of people and Chaucer, they, they had access to the Canterbury Tales. They all read them. They read the Greek classics and stuff. And for English, he's sort of the, the beginning of the flowering of the English language, the expansion of the vocabulary, and the, the belief that, like, he could have written in Latin. Everybody who was any, worth anything wrote, would write in Latin. Thomas More wrote Utopia in Latin, but um, Chaucer chose to write in English. He thought it was, it was good enough. And he's living at the same time as these Italian guys, like Dante and Boccaccio <clears throat> and Petrarch are writing some of the greatest uh, literature in history, right? This, the Italian Renaissance. And he thinks English is good enough to write at the same time as those guys. So um, he's, he, he's, without Chaucer, you don't have the, the greats that come after him. Uh, Isaac Newton said, we stand on the shoulders of giants. And Chaucer actually may have, uh, I, I know he read Boccaccio, uh, he may have even met him. Um, <clears throat> Wycliffe, Wycliffe brings us back to the religious thing and religion will have to stay with us for a few more lectures because it's very significant and a lot of people fight over it and it changes the way English culture and society look forever. Wycliffe, although he lived <clears throat> during the Black Death, uh, you, Chaucer and him were both born and were very young, so they were lucky to survive. Um, this is, what, when is, uh, let me think, 15, the 1520s. So. It's a hundred, it's a good hundred years, 150 years before Martin Luther starts the Reformation, which splits the church and uh, starts the Protestant movement. But Wycliffe, John Wycliffe had some, some of the similar ideas. You'll have to read about it in the book. It's at the end of chapter two. Um, let me see here. What page is it exactly? It's in here somewhere. Yeah, 76. <clears throat> it needs its own heading probably, but 76, um, there's Chaucer there and Wycliffe is in th those pages um, from 75 over to 78 is where it talks about Chaucer and Wycliffe, right? Um, obviously, Luther is the father of the, of the Reformation, but in England, Wycliffe came up with a lot of these ideas already. Uh, he, wanted to do, he wanted to make English Bibles. He wanted people to be able to read uh, the Bible in English, which was not allowed. Uh, you were only allowed to print the Bible from the Vulgate, which is in a Latin version. And he wanted it to have it in the language of the people, the vernacular. And that's something Luther wanted to do too. He thought the church was too rich and that the church property should be uh, taken and divided amongst the people, sort of like making it public land instead of having it as church land. Uh, that was pretty controversial, but he wanted to do that. Um, what else did he do? Uh, he, he, had, he, he was a scholar. Um, he was a priest from Oxford, um, and he was sort of, I guess he was sort of uh, humanistic in the sense that he was thinking that individuals and should be free to do more interpretation of the Bible. Um, so he was, he was trying to take uh, some of the power away from the church and its control of, of the word of God, of the Bible, and of learning, and put it in the hands of the people. And he just thought that the church structure enabled the church to control too much, and it was too wealthy, and that it would, um, people would be better served if they understood the Bible themselves, and that the wealth was distributed evenly. And that, that's why I said it so, sort of sounds a bit communist, because he kind of wants to abolish this property and just kind of redistribute it amongst the public. I'm not sure exactly how he expected that would go, but the people that followed him were called Lollards, and um, they were some, John of Gaunt supported them. 
Uh, that's one of the reasons that uh, John Wycliffe never got burned, even though it's a heresy, even though he's a heretic. Um, he was never burned at the stake or um, tried as a witch or, or put in jail uh, because John of Gaunt protected him. He just, he had to leave Oxford and he had to, you know, sort of retire and stop preaching. Um, but he was never punished, you know, other than that, sort of forced into retirement. That was his punishment for getting a whole bunch of people to go against the Catholic Church, which is very mild for the period. So whereas heretics uh, are being killed by the thousands in Spain and France, uh, in England, you have to stop doing that. You're not allowed to say those things against the church and uh, go home and behave yourself. That's the punishment. So anyway, John Wycliffe, he had a very big influence on the development later of the English church and um, in England, the, the effort to print English Bibles and to understand it, which also happened in Scotland. And uh, I think I'll stop there for today. I'll have a short one. The quiz it should be functioning this week. So good luck on that. And I'll see you on Friday. Have a good week.